Good morning, everybody, uh, and welcome. I'm Margaret Lowe, president of Atlantic Live. Um, it's so, a pleasure to see so many of you here on this perfectly beautiful fall day and to welcome you for a conversation with the actress Kathleen Turner. This is part of a new series that we're calling We the People. That is, we the people as in we the people of the United States in order to form a more perfect union. As you know, that's the preamble to our Constitution, and it effectively describes the earliest vision for what America would stand for, how we would behave. Um, the founding of this country was based on the notion that our leaders would seek common ground and be willing to compromise in order to achieve the greater good, and as we all know, uh, that's been a little bit challenging lately. So today, uh, and in all these Le Atlantic conversations, we're going to be exploring the notion of civitas. And by way of ex explanation of that word, um, in ancient Rome, civitas, in the simplest terms, meant the social contract that bound citizens together. And we're going to explore what that notion means for today as we talk about uh, talk with people trying to address some of this country's biggest challenges. I want to um, take a moment to thank the American Federation of Teachers, our underwriter. They are the people making this conversation possible. And with that, it gives me enormous pleasure to introduce AFT's Executive Vice President, Mary Catherine Ricker. Mary Catherine, would you come up and uh, share a few thoughts? I'd love to. Thank you. Thank you so much. I am really pleased to welcome all of you here today on behalf of the American Federation of Teachers. Um, I want to say thank you to Steve Clemens and to the wonderful Kathleen Turner, who are, will be joining us in this really important conversation, this timely conversation. The AFT is proud to help sponsor this conversation series, and it is a real treat to be here for this one. Uh, AFT President we Randy Weingarten would love to have been here herself, but as she has been these past many months, she is on the campaign trail, um, dutifully working for our endorsed candidates from the top of the ticket all the way through to our local races. Um, and so I actually, seeing her crisscross the nation, I think celebrity and politics, this is a timely conversation. Um, even outside of this year's presidential election, we've come to expect a certain level of political engagement from celebrities we venerate. Um, I know we are always proud in the labor movement um, and gratified to see when stars uh, give a shout out to their union. It was a number of years ago when I was a rank and file middle school English teacher in St. Paul, Minnesota, um, hearing Natalie Portman give a shout out to her union uh, when she won her Academy Award and thinking, we have something in common. <laughs> this is. Um, this is the sort of bond that when a celebrity offers their name um, to a political cause that we can feel together. Um, that special bond of solidarity, uh, whether it is the, whether it is with the Actors' Equity Association, the Screen Actors Guild, the NFL Players Association, at its heart, political activism is about more than just lending your name to a cause. Celebrities can use the attention they generate to lift up voices of those who might not otherwise be heard. I know Mark Ruffalo has been advocating for water rights long before the mainstream media caught on to what was happening in Flint, Michigan. I know he's shining a spotlight on the brave protesters at Standing Rock. And of course there's Jesse Williams who's used his megaphone to elevate the movement for black lives. And celebrities are people too. We, ha we cannot forget this piece, which is why many of them dedicate their, themselves to an issue that is deeply personal to them, that likely was personal to them before they became a celebrity. We look at Matt Damon and public education and his lifelong commitment to developing expertise on issues. Um, We've also seen it with Leonardo DiCaprio, Angelina Jolie, George Clooney, and of course with our guest today, Kathleen Turner's lifelong commitment to reproductive rights and reproductive justice is an inspiration. I am immensely grateful for the work of celebrities, and I am mindful of the real risks they take when they engage in this work. Perhaps the risk of alienating fans, or falling out of favor with producers or managers or losing out on future work. In my home state of Minnesota, an NFL player, Chris Cluey, who played for the Vikings, may have jeopardized his position with the Vikings uh, when he spoke in favor of marriage equality and against a proposed constitutional amendment in 2012. He knew what was at risk, but he didn't let that stop him from doing what he believed was the right thing for our state. 
Fast forward to a couple years, and we've seen both the blowback and support Colin Kaepernick has faced for his very peaceful protests. It's almost as if people believe that you lose your First Amendment rights when you gain your celebrity, and that couldn't be farther from the truth in this country. I'm grateful to those celebrities who won't let that perception silence them. And who better to hear from on this issue today than Kathleen Turner? Kathleen, when you're out here, on behalf of me, my daughter, and the countless women I represent in my union, thank you for being a tireless champion of women's rights. It is sobering to say perhaps we need your voice more than ever. And so without further ado, I will hand it back over to Margaret to introduce our conversation today. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks so much. Um, ever so briefly, uh, thank you so much, Catherine, and thank you again to AFT. Um, really, really, after that uh, searing and soaring, uh, those remarks, um, please silence your cell phones. Um, but do keep them close because we would love you to uh, tweet using the hashtag WeThePeopleATL. Uh, with that, that uh, let's get rolling. Um, I'm going to just do a little biography of Kathleen Turner. Um, she's been an actor and an activist for nearly 40 years. Um, those of you who may remember her film debut in the Steam thriller Body Heat. Um, I was just recounting that in the late 80s she was also the voice of Jessica Rabbit in the Toon Noir Who Framed Roger Rabbit. She was the one that uh, uh, uttered the line which I loved and still love, I'm not bad. I can't even do this. I'm just drawn that way. I hope she'll, <laughs> I hope she'll repeat that. Um, as Mary Catherine said, uh, Turner has continued to act throughout the decades, and throughout, she has always focused a lot of her attention on politics. She chairs Planned Parenthood's Board of Advocates, is on the Board of People for the American Way. She used, used her celebrity to help champion women's health, civil rights, human rights. She just told me in the green room that she's been involved over the years uh, in Manhattan with Meals on Wheels. She is here with the Atlantic's Washington editor-at-large, Steve Clemens. Steve, Kathleen, take it away. Good to be with all of you this morning. Um, thank you for those wonderful introductions and comments. And Kathleen and I have already been juicing it up in the back, uh, and so we've got a plan here. I guess oh, yeah. the, the, the big question I want to start with is, are you an activist that just happens to act, or are you an actress mm. that found activism? Well, certainly the activism preceded uh, with the, the celebrity. Huh? That um, my father was a foreign service officer. And I grew up in the tradition, basically, that we do serve. And even overseas, uh, as representatives of our country's government, we, my mother and my siblings and myself, would always volunteer uh, in Venezuela at an orthopedic hospital, uh, in London at a clinic. Um, so that has always, but at the same time, you see, I was always going to be an actor. Always. So, always. so they, they were they were blended. Yeah. When you, you know, I, I was thinking about this and, and the long list of uh, activists that, that our friend just uh, mentioned, yeah. all tend to be wrapped around progressive causes. And I'm interested what happens when you run into John Voight. <laughs> oh, wow. Well, one thing, I turned down working with him. <laughs> I did. Um, I tell you, you, you know, I simply, I don't, I don't believe, and this is where I think we've lost, we've gone off track a lot in our country. I don't believe that everyone has to believe as I do. Uh, I, it is not my place to educate them or enforce them or do anything else. It is my right to try and persuade mm -hmm. to by example or by you know, by reason, um, but if they disagree, it, I, it's not a judgment call. They're not better or worse than me. They're not right or wrong. Well, I don't know about that. You know, I think it's interesting because one of the, the themes that we've been exploring in this series that we've called We the People is the ability to have those debates and discussions, but at the end of the day, after the fight was fought, uh, do you come back together and remember you're, you're basically under the same tent, on the same boat? And so I am interested yeah. in this question of right. how you see your rivals, maybe acting rivals, maybe, uh, 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 maybe acting rivals is the wrong way to put it, okay. but political rivals, policy rivals, people who are trying to work for a different country than you're working for. Oh, tough, 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 tough question. Uh, it is very hard for me to understand 
why people feel the need to impose their beliefs on others. Mm. Uh, I, I, it's sort of a blind spot, I suppose, in my, in my brain. I just don't understand why they feel the need to, to what is the word, proselytize? Mm -hmm. huh? That, um, and it, this nation was surely founded on a freedom of speech, on freedom of religion, on uh, the right to pursue your career and your beliefs as, as you believed. Uh, and anything outside of that, I do not understand. Mm -hmm. So when, when you encounter, when I encounter someone who will say, you know, that, that a woman's right to choose what she should do, be doing with her body is uh, a moral or evangelical or religious issue. Uh, first of all, it's almost invariably that they are male, hmm. which loses my respect immediately. Sorry, guys. Uh, but I don't understand what basis they have to speak on. Um, so it's, it's difficult. I suppose I try and remind them more than anything that is, is my right to think differently. Hmm. You know, I was thinking um, when we, hoping we met, to sort of look at your next productions that you might do down the road. And if HBO came to you and offered a, you know, pr pretty good set of Cartier watches or something for playing Phyllis Schlafly or Anita Bryant. Would you yeah. do it? Now, this came up. I was here in Washington doing... Oh, somebody asked that question? Something like it. Yeah, it's I was irritating. Doing, I thought it was I completely was doing, original. No, I was doing Molly Ivins. You know, it was a uh -huh. wonderful liberal right, Texas... Right. B b oh, biting comedian, political writer. In any case, and someone said... Now, this was uh, four years ago. So someone said, well, would you be able to do Sarah Palin? And I said, no. No, I really, I, I mean, <laughs> acting is not pretending, right. you know, I really have to have a basis of belief in what I, in what I do, and I just, I, I would, that would, I would be a very bad actor in that role. You know, next Tuesday, I love the fact that we're doing this, and we're just, what, five days away from uh, one of the biggest choices in the country, right? It's, yeah. it's uh, I mean, I, I had, when you're up there acting on stage, you say, wow, Tuesday's deal. I know you've already voted, but yeah. what do you think is going on in the country? I mean, you've been trying to channel the soul of this country and the mm. soul of relationships and the soul of... You know this. The, you know the the, the the various efforts to dominate and control women. What do you think is going on in the country? Hmm. I want to start by saying that I I believe I believe that Americans are inherently good and that we will do the right thing. I really do believe that. Um, as to the control, I think, and this has become clearer now than at any time, I think, in mm -hmm. our history, that it is a fear of, of primarily white men who are losing a power base or losing what they feel to be their power. Uh, and it is their ability, I mean, that traditionally, the men have in this country been the patriarchal societal uh, controllers of women, yeah? Um, and that they were able to do that before there was the science mm. to enable us to control our own bodies. Uh, now that that is no longer true, then they must uh, find another way to dominate. And I believe that this is essentially fear. Mm. It is fearfulness. If they don't control women, then who do they control? Oh, gee, <laughs> maybe responsible for themselves. That's a tough one. Let's talk about celebrities. But I love men. <laughs> <laughs> I had to say Good. that, sorry. Uh, let's talk about celebrities just as a class, because one of the questions that often comes up, and, and I think it was laid out, is that some people love celebrities jumping in and sponsoring things. I had, and this is, this is on the record, uh, uh, but I had a conversation that she shared with Demi Moore once, and when she was still with Ashton Kutcher, they were going through, and she asked me and talked to me about what sorts of causes that were out there that, that I thought they might attach themselves to. What? I'm, I'm not kidding. And, and uh, the one that they were leaning 
leaning towards at the time, and I don't have, was looking at uh, women that were um, victims of sexual and, and human trafficking uh, and working on that. And I do think that Demi Moore went in that direction finally. But it's, it's a different formula than I think you brought to the table, saying that you have these core concerns. And I'm interested in the industry of celebrityism. Is, is there an, uh, a group of consultants that help celebrities find the cause they're for? I have absolutely no idea, mm. but uh, <laughs> no, I, I am, but I mean, I am to, practical. Yeah. I am I'm very practical. Yeah. I mean, I was first drawn and always drawn to uh, women's health. That right. really became the, my most driving thing when I first moved back to the United States when I was 18 and started um, college at the University of Maryland, Southwest Missouri State uh, in Springfield, Missouri. And it was, I mean, at that time I had no money, and my father had just died, and we were really, truly cut loose in every way. Um, and so I went to the Planned Parent Clinic in Springfield, mm. Missouri, to get the health care that I needed, and for which I have, I have felt indebted, and and knowing how what that did for me, how that mm -hmm. saved me, uh, then when I had no resources, uh, I will continue to fight that fight uh, without pause. But when I, when I started on People for the American Way about 31 years ago, mm. see, I, I kind of predate celebrity, huh? Um, that is freedom of speech, protection right. of the First Amendment, and watchdog of the religious right. That is our mm. mandate. Uh, then I live in New York City, so I am on the board of City Meals on Wheels, mm -hmm. and we now feed over 19,000 people a year, over two million meals a year. And, uh, and it's growing, right. you know. But these are all programs where I can show up and be mm -hmm. part of. I can stand in front of that capital. Mm -hmm. I can open a clinic. You, know, you, you have here. a wonderful yeah. new clinic here on 4th Street Northeast. And you helped open it what month? Oh, it was just it's last just month. brand new, yeah. Yeah, just last month we opened it. Um, it's very nice. Bravo. Anyway. Uh, City Meals on Wheels, I can I literally carry meals. Um, one of my rules hmm. is that my name does not appear on any invitation at which I am not present. Hmm. So even if it's one of my organizations, if it says Kathleen Turner, then Kathleen Turner is there. If I am not and cannot, then it, my name is not on it. Hmm. That's my basic rule. That, that's fascinating. So. Uh, to, to, I'm going to make very clear to the audience to me more. I, I sort of admired the fact that someone who might not have a cause was nonetheless trying to find where their presence could move the needle on something important. And I, and I sort of thought her earnest interest in what were the big gaps, because they're also, they're, they're sort of safe causes and unsafe ones. They're ones that, like we were talking right, about the popular, risks. Right, yeah. yeah, so tell us a little bit about that. I mean, just t share with us how you feel your industry is doing. Ah, well, in fact, I think there are some very good uh, people out there working. I think you mentioned Matt Damon for education. Water and education. Yeah, and uh, yeah, I, I think that uh, Ben, um, oh, I'm so bad with names. Affleck. Yes, what he's doing uh, in Africa is valuable. Um, yes, huh. and, but these are, again, these are hands-on people, yeah? They show up and they do the work. What kind of risks have you taken in your in your high profile with Planned Parenthood? There have been, there have been. After the Boston bombings, the clinic bombings, mm. there I went up to help with the services and the the memorials and everything. And I received many death threats. Uh, my mother, God bless her, uh, you know, wrote me and begged me to stop. That she had received threats that uh, sent to her you know, that say goodbye to your daughter stuff. Um, so she was very, that, that bothered me more than any threat to myself. Mm. You know, leave my mom out of it, you know, kind of thing. <laughs> or I'll, then now I'll get you, you know, but. Uh, uh, I, I've worried uh, about the effect on my daughter, mm. but my daughter is a grown woman now and tells me that's none of my business. <laughs> she apparently doesn't like it when you talk about sex. Well, of course not. Yeah, no, yeah. no, 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 no. She always closed her eyes. 
Um, <laughs> what we, I'm just but, saying that, that, if, that if you read about Kathleen Turner, some of the most wonderful vignettes are what you've revealed about your conversations with your daughter about various things you l say about your various urges, and, you, and your daughter apparently goes, goes crazy. Yeah. Well, yeah. this one, the play I'm doing now at Arena Stage is um, the year of magical thinking, and it's Joan Didion's work on, on, the, on grief, on, on yeah. the understanding of grief and loss in her life. And so my daughter came to oh. opening. My daughter comes to every opening. And she went backstage and she said, you know, Mom, one of these days, would you do a play where your kid doesn't die? <laughs> I said, what are you talking about? I said, Mother Courage. I said, yeah, I lost three there, yeah. <laughs> and she said, Virginia Woolf. I said, well, but yeah, but that was imaginary. <laughs> and I should note that the play is open until November 20th. And if you don't mm. all run to get your tickets, you're, you're disturbed. Um, <laughs> I am interested, you, you said recently about Hillary Clinton. You write, mm. I honestly do not understand the so-called distrust of Hillary. I really don't. I understand the confusion of the emails and a lot of the procedural stuff that's very iffy, but I don't see how that adds up as distrust of her altogether. And I'm interested because what would it take for Hillary Clinton to lose you if you were in a, an imaginary situation? Because mm. to a certain degree, that's what a lot of folks out there are asking Republicans to do with Donald Trump. So what does it take for a political leader or someone you have faith in or, or I uh, aspirations? I so what could they lose you? They could lose me if I saw intentful harm, if I saw that they did something uh, knowing that it would be hurtful or damaging to someone else. This would be true of any person, not simply a, le um, a political leader. But if I saw malice of forethought, yes. Mm. You love food. I do. Me. And Jose I Andres cook, has I become one eat. of your, your good buddies. Jose Andres, if you many of you know, lives here in Washington and apparently on Saturdays and Sundays has this wonderful array of food delivered to your stage door. He does. Um, I don't have time between shows, Saturdays uh -huh. and Sundays. I have two shows each day. And so I ran into Jose at one of his restaurants and he said, what do you need? I said, Food between shows on the weekends? Si, fine, fine. Where do you want it? Stage door? What time? Uh, uh. Four o'clock. Right, he's done. And it's still coming. Yeah. And, and what do you have? Well, he's got these three restaurants on the seventh, you know, Haleo and Oyamel and now China Chilcado. And just one and so they each Michelin. take a yeah. they each take a weekend. <laughs> <laughs> and you said not too spicy. Well, you have to think of the throat, the voice. So, yeah, I, I, so I'm interested in the in you know the broad question of you you know you as a celebrity here in town and you're you know you're in Washington D.C. and I guess we're a little self-indulgent. You know, this town is always the most hated town in the country when it when it comes to election season. No one wants to. I mean, we're in the events business and people really don't want to appear in Washington D.C. right before a big federal national election. So, what do you think of Washington in your time here? Well, I, I am growing to love Washington, honestly. Mm. I, I've always lived in New York. Never tried the other coast, never wanted to. But um, I, I guess I was, I was saying my first play here was at the Kennedy Center, I think 36 years ago. And at that time, when the curtain came down, the whole town was dark. I mean, there was nothing. There was no place to get a good bite of food. There was no place to get a nice glass of wine. It was. Dead. Things shut down by 9 p.m. Oh, right? Lord. Yeah, so. We were lucky if anybody stayed through the curtain. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, but, but now, now, my stars, the changes in 36 years is, is, are delightful. Who would you uh, like to see in, who do you, who would, I mean, how, this may be an odd and stupid question, but I'm interested in the political set and how someone like you who's performing and who's channeling feeling, who on the political scene, other than Hillary Clinton or Trump, do you admire as a performer? As a performer? Mm -hmm. Now that's a good question. Al Franken. Ah, uh, interesting. Elizabeth Warren. Uh, let me think. I, I like, um, I like Claire McCaskill. Mm. I think she's got a. She's good, got big drama and good yeah, voice. Yeah, yeah, she's yeah. got good presence, huh? Um, that's all that floats up right any, away. Any Republicans that come to mind? Ah, funny, my mind didn't go there. <laughs> Heavens to Betsy. Um, ah, no. <laughs> 
Well, this takes me to my question. You've been really active in Planned Parenthood, and I, and I you know, love your um, journey in that. But as I was telling you, when I lived in Los Angeles and was supporting some of what Planned Parenthood did, the people that would le were leading in Planned Parenthood support in LA, this is 25, 30 years ago, were almost the senior Republican attorney crowd. And then later, uh, and I noticed when President Bush uh, was still in office, uh, there was a debate about the fact that his grandparents had helped establish it. Barbara Bush was oh. involved. And so where today in your leadership with Planned Parenthood are the, the Republican set? Are they still there but quiet? Are they there but loud? What's the deal in terms of thinking across the aisle? So that if Planned Parenthood is just a Democratic uh, cause, then in yeah, my book no. it's a big problem. Yeah, no, it is a big problem. Um, uh, I think that we have a real problem with language, and this is not this is true not just of Planned Parenthood, but when they um, co-opted the uh, right to life, you know what does that make us uh, pro-life? Um, uh, so I think that we've been behind in many ways on finding how to message what we do. That uh, you know the the truth is that that we now are the basic healthcare for millions and millions of women who cannot afford any any other, no, there's no other access. Mm -hmm. um, what's happening in places like Texas, where we know uh, hundreds of thousands of American citizens are going to Mexico to buy contraception because they can't afford mm -hmm. it in their own state. Now, I've got a daughter, and uh, I, I don't want her buying her, her contraception in, in Mexico, I mean, mm -hmm. No offense, but that's true. Right. Um, the fact that this, to me, seems particularly in a state like, oh wait, let me back up a moment. Okay, one of the things I do uh, as chairman of the Board of Advocates is to travel to different affiliates across the country to help raise money, events, awareness. So I was in Oregon for their annual breakfast event mm. in, uh, in this spring. And one of the things I set out to find, because I try and find out as much as I can, superficially, I confess, you know, about the place where I'm going. Oregon is rated the friendliest state for women in the country hmm. for several reasons. One, you can buy, you can have a full year supply of birth control hmm. in one prescription. So that's one doctor's visit one prescription, you can, uh, there's great many more support programs for women's health, et cetera. And I wanted to know why. It turns out, to my knowledge, it is a direct response between the number of women in the legislature. Hmm. The legislatures that have three to seven percent women, i.e. Texas, Oklahoma, Iowa, um, have the least supportive laws. The higher the percentage of women in elected office, the kinder and the more supportive the state is. Hmm. This is very clear. And it gives us a very clear track on which to proceed. Any interest in running for office yourself? I think they're crazy. Uh, I think that would be <laughs> No, I can't imagine not acting. Uh. I, I've got one job in mind. All right, I would become uh. ambassador to England, to the court of St. James, so that I could be on the West End at night. I hope. And then I could be in the embassy in the day. I hope somebody just Snapchatted that and, 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 and sent that out. You know, I was reading this wonderful review of your performance in A Year of Magical Thinking uh, by Nelson Presley in the, in the Washington Post. And he said that, you know, because I, I, I know Joan Didion's writing, it's wonderful writing, but it's also very icy and very precise and couldn't have, I mean, I just, I'm really looking forward to seeing you perform because you're so different than a Joan Didion character. Uh, and I knew that before reading the piece, and he said that what's clear is that you make, you know, your, your key is, is, is that you're prevailing over a life uh, lifetime of long nights, and that you've had a lot of rough crap happen in your life in various ways, struggles that you've had. Um, like you, my father uh, died when uh, I was young, and you know things like that happen. And I'm interested in whether those sorts of experiences, I don't know if you want to reflect on them, you do in your book certainly, change the way in which people are more willing to accept the kind of concept we're talking here today, civitas. Does hardship, does struggle, does overcoming alcohol? Yeah, in a way. I mean, I'm just sort of interested in the ingredients that you see in making people more compassionate, more empathetic. 
with well, people I that think, differ from them. I think that difficulties, be they physical hardships like mm. rheumatoid arthritis, right. that is my personal battle for many years, uh, and the subsequent pain or fear that that mm. creates, the loss of, of loved ones, the loss of a relationship. These, oh, there are so many battles that are possible, huh? Uh, one thing it does is it takes away your sense of invulnerability. You are vulnerable. Mm. You can indeed be hurt. If this is true for you, it must be true for others. Mm. And so in that sense, yes, I think we cannot help but uh, find some common ground. Um, we are not unique. Uh, you know, our suffering is 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 shared mm. so widely that that must be acknowledged, I think. But it seems like you seem to demonstrate it in a way that makes people realize it about themselves. But I also have to find humor. Huh. If I can't make people laugh, then they forget about it. Uh -huh. I get I get laughs out of dying. Okay, <laughs> <this is> <laughs> <laughs> you did for me right now. You also made this interesting comment about Hillary Clinton that I love is that. Um, you, I don't know if I love it, but it's an interesting reflection. I, I'm interested, if you were her consultant or PR consultant or her uh, uh, advisor on how to fix it, you say that she doesn't go through the camera. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and that, no, that's, that's one of her biggest problems. And I want to mention, do you think Donald Trump goes through the camera? And what is he doing that she's not on, on that interesting observation? Well, when I was starting out, uh, and it will be 40 years next year, yeah, I'm going to have a party. Anyway. Uh, Is there a remake, ma remake of Body Heat in the works? Hell no. <laughs> uh, no. But, uh, but when I was cast in Body Heat and I went around frantically saying to people, how do you make the camera love you? And they would say, you don't. Mm -hmm. Either it does or it doesn't. I'd say, no, not good enough. Not good enough. No. I know. You have to be away. Um, I saw uh, one of, an actor who I think is one of the best actors of my generation, a man do this play, um, a one-man show, it was off-Broadway, and it was the play about this auto worker, a uh, Ford worker or something in North Carolina, so he had, had a brand new baby, and the wife had left, and left him mm. with this infant, this tiny infant, and each night he would come home and he would have this screaming child and try and settle, and in the course of this play, and this is a true story, evidently. Mm. He has an imaginary infant in his arms, but you see his arm just shush, you know, shush, baby shush, and the arm just, and he ended up crushing the child's mm. skull and immediately rushed to the hospital. But in any case, this is a, a moment, an image I will never forget, mm. as you can see. Then I saw him in a, uh, on TV, and I didn't recognize him at all. Interesting. I didn't even see him. Huh. Somebody had to tell me that was the actor I think is so good. He does not go through the camera. Hmm. I think it loves you or it doesn't. So there's uh, nothing you have to go back to do. the original. I don't, I can't, I don't have any advice there. I mean, and it's I'm an interesting a good challenge teacher. because if she does win on Tuesday, communicating with a net challenge, going and, you know, developing a presence uh, via television and other medium is really important. Well, so much, of, so much of her ability, of course, hangs on the uh, makeup of the, of the Senate and I mean, what, will, what will be available there. Why aren't you writing more Huffington Post articles? <laughs> You've got some great ones. She's got some yeah. titles here. Jeb Bush is, in quotes, not sure we need women's health funding. I'm not sure we need Jeb Bush. Yeah, okay. um, Republicans' playbook on women gets even scarier when it comes to choice. Hillary's the only choice, etc. But I, I think that the issue beyond uh, the partisan tilt here is you—you you have deep thoughts about this. You write. You wrote a book about your life, mm. and and do you have any plans to sort of share more of this? And, and as you a ask, ask this, I want to ask an, a selfish Atlantic question. We ran a cover story, many of you will remember, uh, by Anne Marie Sla Slaughter called "Why Women Still Can't Have It All," and it helped oh. trigger a debate. Sheryl Sandberg and others said, you're wrong, we can have it all, and here's, here's the pathway to do it. And I'm interested in, in your story. What, one, mm. what is your take, not only your own life story, but your counsel to young women today who are making I their do. way through this world? Well, when I teach, and I, I enjoy teaching very much, um, I teach juniors and seniors in college, or I do master mm. classes um, 
for people who are in the business. Any case, I, I am often asked, mm. how was it that I could have a marriage and a child and a, uh, keep it all together, as it were? Mm. And quite honestly, my answer w was, and I think is, that you or your partner, or between the two of you, have to be able to hire a wife. <laughs> because you cannot make sure that there is milk in the fridge every morning. And you will not be able to pick that child up from school every day. Um, you've got to have. Uh, if you've got two working people, you have got to have help. And that's something that is very possible in this country and under Miss Clinton's presidency. I think she recognizes that, for heaven's sakes. And about your writing? Uh, I like to write. I'm, I'm not... Um, I'm not great, not good. It takes me a lot of rewriting. Um, I'm a better editor than I am a writer. Uh, but Maybe when I offer you an opening here, <laughs> how much uh, do you pay? Um, I was just going to go. Ah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, switching to switching subjects. Uh, I love this, this, what you wrote, looking back on my life, and this is from your book, an excerpt, looking back on my life now, it's been a bumpy road. I've had personal tragedies, rocky relationships, out of control drinking, snarky critics, and woman hating film bosses to contend with. I've come back against all odds from a debilitating, debilitating illness after being told I'm in a wheelchair for the rest of my life, in parentheses, to which I said, go fuck yourself, I took the stars out. I've, I've experienced the joy of motherhood, the sadness of infertility, and a happy marriage that eventually became a necessary separation. I mean, you're very, very in touch with who you are and what you've gone through. Um, and again, I guess I'm coming back to it. I find it so powerful in my whole exploration of how you shared yourself. What sorts of insights can you give to, to those of us not quite as comfortable being as honest and direct? I mean, well, there's an see, interesting think, thing I there. Think, I think the point is honesty. Mm. Um, uh, I think that, and, and this frightens some of my friends and family, you know, when they say to me that, do you have to be so honest? I think it's also uh, a lack of, of ego, honestly. Mm -hmm. I don't mm -hmm. believe I am very vain. She really? doesn't carry a mirror. Really? I don't know. I, uh, I never, this I is never a true a fact. Mirror. She didn't carry a didn't mirror. Carry in a mirror. Yeah, yeah. I couldn't check myself yeah. anyway. Uh -huh. um, but, but um, you know, it's, I'm, I'm not the center of the universe. Mm. I mean, I'm, I'm, be, uh, I, I'm necessary to the universe in my mm. in my existence, I believe, but I'm not the center. And, so, um, just be not. before I go to the audience and, and get their questions, and to come back to this topic of celebrity activism and celebrities weighing in on policy issues, I'm interested in whether you think in the ingredient for what makes a successful celebrity spokesperson or advocate, does that lack seeming lack of vanity? Does that ability to be honest? Put you on par. I mean, we mentioned a lot of celebrities here, and I sort of said, you know, it's a big basket, but but you you seem to me very different. I, and I'm wondering if you were to instruct, if you were to have a master class to celebrities on how to be policy advocates, would this be part of the, your instruction? It's it, it's showing up. Hmm. It's showing up is the bottom line, and not necessarily showing up with an entourage or showing up with the. I mean, I really think that there are very few situations in which one's life is actually threatened. Hmm. You may have to deal with a lot of people asking for selfies hmm. or autographs or something like that. All that takes is time, hmm. and you allow it. Hmm. You just allow a little more time to do those things. Um, there went my selfie request. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Let me uh, it's showing up. That's yeah. the bottom line. Let me open up to the floor. Yes, right here in the back. Thank you, Ms. Turner. Um, I'm wondering if earlier in your career you were as courageous and honest and direct as you are today. Uh, no, I doubt it. I doubt it because I simply didn't, wasn't as self-aware. Uh, I probably was more self-involved, you know. Um, I, I think as you grow, as you age, your life opens and broadens. One hopes that this is the process. Surely it should be. Uh, so I don't think I could have been when I, I was I, much just younger. Just to piggyback for a second, I sort of wondered in the way you performed in Body Heat and changed the way the country thought about sex, 
whether that was an element of activism. And you said that growing up at Britain, which is so different and people weren't living in the closet quite nearly as much a, a, on that, whether that, would that help turn on the activist DNA? Well, I think, I mean, I think that America's attitude towards sex is, uh, is ridiculous and always has been. The hypocrisy of, um, you know, telling women how to dress and then having bikini models sell beer is, has never ceased to astound me. You know, um, at least in, in Europe and other countries, uh, yeah, that's a bare-breasted photo, okay. And uh, so I'll tell you a story. When I did The Graduate in London, and there's full frontal nudity uh, for all of 27 seconds or something, I don't know. Anyway, big, big deal, right? And, but we were hugely successful, and they said, well, now we'll take it to Broadway, and I said, no. Mm. I said, no, I don't need it. I don't need the crap that Americans will give me for doing this. No, no, no. So I went off and did another play on Tallulah. Mm. And while I was on tour, I got a script from a filmmaker, and the character was described as 37, but still attractive. Mm. <laughs> wow. Now, at that time, I was 47, so I called up the British producer and said, we are going to Broadway. <laughs> <laughs> and we did. <laughs> Fantastic reviews, which I've also read. Other question, yes. Ms. Turner, I really appreciate your comments about the, uh, the pro-life and that the messaging, and I, I wonder if you could, you know, I've been so discouraged by the lack of recognition how reproductive rights are connected to self-determination and dignity. Would you have suggestions for how the progressive side could be better messaging? I Honestly, I have tried to put this together for some time. I worked with previous uh, presidents of Planned Parenthood before mm. Cecile. Uh, and what I ran up against again and again, now not with Cecile, I will say this, uh, but previous um, presidents, I ran up against, don't make waves. So I would try and put together, you know, a group of filmmakers, ad experts, uh, musicians, and say, let's come up with a common, you know, thing. And they would say, no, you know, we don't want to make, the, keep your head down, is basically mm -hmm. the message I kept getting. Uh, I disagree strongly with this, uh, and, but I think that it is uh, also our responsibility simply as women uh, to demand the health care that by law uh, is, we should have. Um, back to the states, guys. Back to the legislature. Yes, right here. Uh, thank you for being with us uh, today, Mrs. Turner. I have a question. What would you say to a celebrity or a professional athlete who refuses to take a stand on a social issue because of concern about losing out on endorsements? I would say that is up to his own conscience, his or her own conscience. If that is not troubling to them, then let it be so. Let me just wrap up. So I assume that you were playing Tallulah Bankhead. I was. I didn't know that. That's not in my notes. I'm intrigued with Tallulah Bankhead. She happens, for those of you who are interested, to be buried out in Chestertown, Maryland, next to her sister. And she had an extraordinary political family. Her grandfather was Speaker of the House, and yeah. she had senators well, and others. Senators, yeah. And I, I find her, so we actually, my, my husband and I have a suite in our house named the Tallulah Bankhead Suite, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, just in honor of Tallulah. I'm interested just in closing out what, what uh, I'm not, not having any idea what you think of her. I'm just, just are you the Tallulah of today? And uh -huh. what do you think Tallulah did in her time that gives us insight into what the challenge for women in a political town and a political world is. Because she used humor, but she was also very, very, very tough and, and cool. Well, she was also uh, an addict in more ways than we can uh. possibly describe. However, what this piece was about, had mm. the, the shape of it was that Tallulah Bank had threw a fundraiser for Harry Truman mm. at her home up in Connecticut. And she was also expecting to use this fundraiser as a launch pad to, for her own political agenda, right? Uh, uh -huh. And uh, she got everything ready, she got everything was prepared, and Truman didn't show up. <laughs> So the first act is the preparation. The second act is four o'clock in the morning, when she, wakes <laughs> having, <laughs> when she wakes up having, having stripped naked and thrown herself into her own pool huh. in front of every dignitary that she could gather. Um, but uh, she, 
She was, yes, very much a groundbreaker mm. in many, many ways. She was, her first celebrity and it started in England. Mm. It was women who adored her, right. you know, and pursued her in every way. But uh, she was one, I suppose, of the first female celebrities, period. Mm. Fascinating. And well, that, ladies and gentlemen, Kathleen Turner, thank you so much for your insights and sharing with us today.